And the next speaker that we have with us is somebody who has just done that. He has had the confidence to drive uh, the customer experience for his own organization, and his name is Jamie Heindhoff. Jamie is COO of BT Sport and BT TV. He has been with them since 2012, following an illustrious career with the BBC, where it culminated in having responsibility for the BBC's multi-platform coverage of the Olympics, Paralympics and other national events. He's travelled from the UK to be with us today, and he's going to tell us about the importance of being different. So if you could please welcome to the stage Jamie Heindhoff of BT. <laughs> Good morning. Come on, I've just come over from the bloody UK. Good morning. Where's that happy Irish welcome? Um, okay, so I'm here uh, to talk to you um, about customer experience, leadership, and change management. And um, as I just said, I've had quite a checkered career. Uh, I used to buy and sell leather around the world. Um, I used to work for a logistics company. I was in the Royal Air Force. Um, and I joined the BBC 20 years ago. Yes, I was nine years old at the time, but, uh, um, and the BBC being the organisation it is means you can do a lot of different things. So I actually joined the BBC at the lowest possible grade, uh, and I was booking cabs, and that was my, my job in the BBC, that was my entry into media. Um, and then I ended up in your world because I ended up managing that transport department and what we used to call a call centre, which I think is now called a contact centre. Uh, I set one of those up and ran that. And what was really interesting for me when I look back is my whole leadership style, my whole management style, my approach to change has all come from that era in my career. Everything I do now, whether it's the sexy stuff on telly or whether it's other stuff I've done through my career, it's the same basic principles that have led me that way. And it was working in that environment that got me there. So I did transport and travel, which is really sexy when you work for the BBC. Uh, and then I got even sexier and became the head of procurement. Um, so I um, joined our finance colleagues and pissed everyone off, to be honest, because I tried to tell them what they could or couldn't do. But what I did do is I had the opportunity um, within the BBC procurement team to get involved in direct spend. Um, as you'll know, in most organisations, procurement is about how cheap you can buy a pen, um, potentially how much you can get a flight for, and telling you when you can't book a train ticket. Um, but what we did is we focused on the core business, and the core business of the BBC was making programmes. Uh, and the only way to learn what that um, environment needs is to go and work in programmes. So, so I went and learned how to make a program. Um, and then in oh, 2009, they advertised the job, as Owen alluded to, as head of production for London 2012. So the biggest terrestrial event the BBC's ever done, multi-platform, responsible for both its news output as well as its uh, sports output, as well as the factual output. So West 1A, if anyone's watched that, um, I can see that and, and sign that off. Um, and... The interesting thing was, they gave me the job. Now, to put that in context, I had never, ever made a TV programme. Um, and I, I actually remember my first day where I thought, what the bloody hell have I done? Because um, I'm sat there, second person in a team, responsible for massive output, and didn't have a clue what to do. But, you, you know, it went quite well. Um, and, and then on the opening ceremony of the um, Olympic Games, while I was quite busy, I got a call from BT. Uh, and it was a very interesting call because I'd actually just finished laughing out loud uh, when I'd heard that BT had spent £765 million on a set of football rights uh, because they're a tele telecoms company. Um, and whilst I was still laughing, the phone rang, and sometimes I wonder whether I should or shouldn't have answered that phone. Um, but it was um, Mark Watson, who was at BT at the time, asked me if I'd come in and talk to them. Uh, and they actually wanted me to go in and talk to them about programme management and change management because... The Olympics was, whilst it was a sexy programme thing, actually it's a, it's a project. Making a TV programme is a project. It, it's nothing more than that, and don't, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Um, so I went in to see them, and um, they offered me the job as uh, COO of uh, BT Sport. I thought, that sounds quite sexy, quite good. don't know what it means, but I'll give it a go. Um, and I didn't really think too much about it, so I then went on and did the Paralympic Games. Um, I did the Athletes' Parade. Um, through the streets of London. I um, signed off on the project, took the weekend off, um, met my wife again, uh, and then started work at BT. Um, 
and, and what I should put say at that point when I talk about my wife, because this is quite a funny anomaly. So my whole career, my, my whole thing has been about change management. It's been about doing things outside of my comfort zone uh, and doing various different things. Uh, and I've also taken that into my personal life because I've been married three times. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite good. And, and I've learned to adapt quite well within that environment. But um, so... Um, so I joined BT, the illustrious BT, massive organisation, quite similar to the BBC in the fact that it was once uh, public ownership. Um, but BT, obviously, private enterprise now, um, going through significant change when I joined. Um, and I literally walked into the mothership, BT Centre, uh, in St Paul's, and realised I was the second person in to set up one TV channel. Um, so I asked to see the budget, there wasn't one. I asked to see the strategy, there wasn't one. Um, I asked to see the team, there wasn't one. I asked where the broadcast chain was, there wasn't one. Um, so how are we going to play out the content, we, we don't know. Um, and then I asked the, the really important question, are you really wanting to launch in nine months? And the answer was yes, that's why we brought you in. Um, so I had nine months, basically, to work within an environment that wasn't a broadcaster. And that, for me, was the absolute biggest challenge. When you work for the BBC, they know what you do. It's in their DNA. That they allow you to have creative hissy fits. They allow you to, um, to work in some unstructured ways in some areas. But going into to BT, which is absolutely, I mean, it's an engineering company. Project management is, is in its DNA. Everything is accountable, forecast, etc. cetera. Um, it was a real challenge. Um, but what I would say is I think what BT showed was that they were brave and they wanted to be disruptive. Uh, and I like being disruptive, that's good fun. Um, and so, you know, my challenge was to become the newest and the oldest broadcaster in the UK. And that's something we achieved on time. Um, what I didn't realise at the time, the consequences were around brand impact. Uh, BT is a very established brand, BT Sport is a very new brand. Um, and what's been very interesting for me and the thing I'm most proud of is from within BT, BT Sport has given BT a new identity. So when they're down the pub now, they can talk about the Arsenal game rather than their broadband not working, which is quite a handy thing to do when you work there. Um, you'll also probably be wondering why I'm, I'm, I'm waffling on here and, and what it's got to do with you guys. But what I would say is, is broadcast is absolutely the heart of broadcast is about customer experience. Uh, and more importantly, especially in the current world, it's about uh, customer engagement as well. So what I want to do is just go through some of the challenges we faced about how and why and what we did to set up BT Sport. Um, because I think there are some relevant things in there, and then hopefully I'll have time to wrap up. I've got a few key things that, for me, have affected me and the impact on what we do. So let's rattle through this. So as I said earlier, I joined BT to launch one channel. That turned into two channels within two months. Uh, and then in February 2013, I was asked to go and help acquire ESPN in the UK uh, and integrate that broadcast workflow into my broadcast workflow, which wasn't actually in place. Um, the ambition within BT Sport is, is magnificent, and, and I thrive on ambition. I like to be challenged. Um, and what this showed is we had to be agile from the start. So, so I built a whole broadcast chain. I've done the concept for it for one channel and then I had to put another one in. Then I had to bring a completely different concept with American content coming across into the third channel. Um, but we haven't stopped there and I can't talk too much about what we're doing at the moment, but um, those of you who read the press about a year ago, we haven't made a, a big deal of noise about it since, is we are now the proud owners of the exclusive um, rights for the Champions League and the Europa League in the UK. Um, it's never happened before, so you won't be able to watch it on ITV or Sky. Um, and there are consequences for that because on a Tuesday and Wednesday night, I will need to show eight games live at the same time. And, and those of you who can do maths will realise that eight live games don't go into three channels. Um, so we've got a massive expansion plan going on. It is the biggest and quickest expansion plan in the history of, of broadcast. Um, and on a Tuesday and Wednesday, come August, we will be the biggest broadcast network in the UK by, by some distance. Um, so when we... Um, when we set about launching, what we needed was a mantra. Uh, in the old days, in the 80s, it used to be a mission statement. Um, but we needed something to tie everything together. Uh, and we came up with three words for us that were absolutely aimed at understanding 
and making sure that we were delivering what the customer wanted. And this was absolutely critical because when you work in broadcast, you have a very strong opinion about how you want to make programs. You have a very strong opinion about what I know you're going to like. And actually the reality is a lot of program makers make programs to meet their own requirements. Uh, and it's absolutely critical that you talk to the audience and you actually talk and you go out and you get research and you understand what people want. And we do that constantly. And sometimes they tell you things you don't want to hear. And sometimes you try to ignore them. But I can guarantee every time you have, that's where it starts going wrong. Um, so we wanted three things. So it was clean, credible, and responsible. So clean is quite a strange one, but that's, that's around the quality of our coverage. So that made sure when we're showing a Premier League game or when we're showing a Viva Rugby game, that it's a clean image, that it's, it works all the way through, that the commentary is at the right level, you've got the right camera angles, etc. Um, and when we say clean, we may go back to basics, get the absolute basics right. Uh, and the challenge for us on that was, I, like many of you, have, have grown up with watching football on one platform, which is Sky. Uh, and Sky have a very formulaic way about how they cover football. Uh, and that's both an opportunity and a challenge because some of the things we did when we first introduced football uh, on BT Sport, like putting the clock down the bottom left, uh, screen in screen, having pitch side presentation rather than in a box, it was quite an interesting reaction from customers because they weren't used to that. They were used to men sitting in ties in a sterile studio environment. And um, we worked long and hard with focus groups to understand whether what we were doing was, was change because we wanted to be different to Sky, or whether it was absolutely because it enhances the, the customer experience. Uh, and as my cab driver told me yesterday when he was bringing me over here, uh, apart from the fact he was a Liverpool fan, which pissed me off, um, he liked it. And, and the thing that he liked about it was it, it had personality. And that was really pleasing for me and really important because that's exactly what we were striving for. And that's what our audiences were telling us they wanted. They wanted to feel part of the event. Um, to work through there. The second thing was about credibility. Um, you've got to be brave, you've got to try new things, but you've got to be credible. And if you look at the history of the rights that we bought in the broadcast market, um, Satanta had a good go at it, failed. ESPN had a good go at it, failed. On digital, going back years ago, had a good go at it, failed. Sky have been absolutely dominant, and each time those rights have come up, they're picked off because of their, their dominance in the market. So we had to be absolutely credible. So we had to build and secure uh, an environment to work in. Um, and we had to make sure that we were demonstrating our prowess about being here to stay. And that was also within our, our coverage as well. And then we had to be responsible. Is that working? Yeah. We had to be responsible because um, the scary thing is, when you actually look at it, the cold hard light, BT's rented a set of football rights for three years. We don't own anything. We've, we've rented the Champions League for the next three years for one billion pound. And now you've got to be responsible with those rights because it doesn't just come down to money. Rights holders want the value of their content to actually increase. And to do that, you've got, if you deliver it responsibly, you can stay in that conversation the next time round. If you don't, you're not going to be there. So there were our, our three mantras uh, very quickly. And I should say this is not a sell for BT Sport. Uh, I'm just using it as a case study. I'm not trying to get you all to convert, but hopefully you have. And if you need details at the end, we can certainly give it to you. Um, but the other thing that customers told us is they wanted choice. Um, so we had to work very hard to bring in other content. So things like the Aviva uh, English Rugby. Um, we've got exclusive women's tennis. We've got exclusive UFC. We've got exclusive NBA. We've got exclusive. There's a word that keeps popping up there. It's called exclusive because exclusive means customers know where to go. We share the European rugby with Sky. Audience figures for that are down on both networks because customers don't know where to go. Um, and customers tell you they don't like that. Um, but we wanted a broad range of choice. But there were two absolute key things from our focus groups and from our own experience that we knew we needed to get across in, in BT Sport. One was personality that I've alluded to and the other was live continuity. So personality was making a conscious decision not to go down the road of touch screens, uh, deep dive analytics, but actually to work with presenters and to bring that personality across. Uh, and we also made a very conscious decision to look at where we could bring in experienced presenters that appeal to a wider demographic 
you, you know, we didn't just want to appeal to people like me, you know, 30, um, middle aged and what have you. Um, and, and so we got people like Claire Bolden come in. Now, Claire Bolden on a pay TV sports network is quite a strange, a strange one. Uh, but she brings something different into the network. But what she also does is bring in a different audience as well. Um, and people like Jake Humphrey, who was known for Formula One, um, now does football for us. And it took time to build his credibility, as I talked about earlier, credibility is important. But he's also a very good presenter. And very good presenters can adapt, and he's done that really well. And we've got a really diverse lineup. People like Tim Lovejoy used to do Soccer AM. Um, we've got Rio Ferdinand on our books as well. Michael Owen, who, if you're a Man U fan, you probably don't like him, and if you're a Liverpool fan, you probably don't like him, which is a, a real challenge, and I won't even go into if you're a Newcastle fan, but there's probably none of those here at the moment. Um, but creating an identity as well is, is, within a pay TV sports network, it's very, very quite hard, because people come in to watch live events and then they bugger off. Um, and that's not good for us, because we want them to come into the live event they come into and then watch another event or get involved with BT Sport, build a relationship with us. We want that relationship with the customer. So we created um, a load of um, what we call shoulder programming. So it's also all about the halo effect. You will all have it in your own businesses around core products. Your core product sells, what can you sell off of that? Uh, and it's the same in programming. Um, and what we did is we created some shows that you would never see on Sky. Um, so we have things like Danny Baker and Danny Kelly who, who do a show that's not scripted. Um, and the key, one of the key things within that is they predict the upcoming week's football results using two toasters. Um, and the one that pops first is the team's going to win. How long the other one takes to pop is how many goals will be scored. Um, Claire Bolding does a chat show for us. Um, so she brings in the big sports stars. And there's a chat show based around sports in front of a live audience in our studios. Um, if any of you watch BBC Two on at 10 o'clock on a Friday night now, that show that we make now also goes out on, on BBC Two. So that's about cross-promotion, that's about awareness, that's about the credibility of BT Sport and our own productions. Um, and we also um, do things like Football's On which, with Ian Stone, which is a, a comedy show with comedians talking about football. Um, and just to show where we wanted to go to be different, because for us, we wanted to be seriously entertaining sports networks. So we wanted to have fun. And on our first Premier League game, and this does show my age, um, we actually launched our coverage with Primal Screen playing live in our audience, um, which for me was fantastic because I got my own gig the night before. Um, but we wanted to make a difference, and this is where the scary stuff comes in. So that picture there in front of you, that very exciting picture, is absolutely unique. That's the biggest TV studio in the UK. Uh, it's the only L-shaped studio in the world. It's the biggest LED-lit studio in the world. Um, and it's the only TV studio in the world that's actually got a glass floor. Okay. That's part of an 80,000 square foot um, production hub in the Olympic Park in Stratford in London. Um, it's got 24 edit suites, nine galleries, um, eight voiceover booths. It houses about 400 production staff. Uh, and the reason I'm telling you all of that is because we built the whole thing in 18 weeks from start to finish. Um, not just the physical build, because we had to build a building within a building, but also the technical fit out, the rehearsals. So I had a lot of risk registers and the top one and everything was dust, um, which was awful. But it, again, it showed the ambition, 18 weeks to do something that when you compare across my industry, is normally takes four years. Um, and when you've, you've got that time period, the easy thing for us would have been to build a box. But our customers told us we wanted something different. This studio is L-shaped because it's completely unique in its design. Yeah, the reason it's L-shaped is it means there's actually three studios in one. Uh, and quite often what happens on a Friday night is we're live on air on three channels with three different shows, some with audiences, some without, at exactly the same time from one studio. Um, and what that enabled us to do was we talked about live continuity. It meant you, could go, you can go from one show to another. It means the audience can see what's happening on another channel and you get that cross-promotion. It's never been done before. Um, and it was quite brave of us to do it, but it does work. It does work, honest, honest gal. Um, looking at the time, because I really want to talk to you. So that's what the studio looks like. Lovely, isn't it? Um, key to all of this, so as I mentioned, we had the nine months. We had the 18 months physical build. We're in one of the most advanced technology companies in the world. Um, you know, when you look at what they're doing with Cloud Connect, stuff like that at the moment, we're just a small example of that. And what's beautiful for me is it means I can tap in 
to that engineering capability using the broadcast element to create something quite special. Um, so believe it or not, we were the first DPP, which is digital production, broadcaster in the UK. We beat the BBC, beat Channel 4, beat Sky, um, because we were able to use that technology from the start. Um, and what that enables you to do, so I'm one of the only broadcasters that doesn't have a tape library, which is great because I've got more space for wardrobe. Uh, but it's also really, really important. And you, th you think about when I was at the BBC, they, they spent millions trying to develop a digital workflow that never happened. Uh, and we were able to do that. And the reason we were able to do that is because we did something very sensible. We didn't try and do anything bespoke. We went out into the market. We bought all these boxes and we plugged them together. Uh, and that's the beauty of being able to start afresh, and that's the beauty about being able to tap into some resource. Um, we didn't just launch three TV channels. We also launched uh, an app as well, uh, and we're also uh, on the website as well. So you can watch our content on the go, live, um, if you've got that app. More importantly for me, though, and again, it's tapping into BT's infrastructure and its network, IP delivery. IP is critical in the world of broadcast now because that allows you to bring personality in. And what do audiences tell you they want? They want personality. They want to feel involved. They want to be able to access what they want when they want it. Uh, IP enables that. So we have video on demand for, for BT Sport. So you can go in if you've missed a game and you can go in and watch it later. Sounds quite simple, but in the normal linear broadcast world, that's very hard. Uh, but with IP, it's fantastic. Um, and we also have our own uh, BT TV platform in, in the UK as well. So you've got your own UV box, you've got your own um, PVR. What that also enables me to do is to be able to put unique content just into that area as well. The beauty of IP is you can personalise what you deliver to who you deliver it to. Um, and that's very exciting for us. And, and when you see what we'll be doing with the Champions League, you'll sort of, it'll come back is why I mentioned it. And, you know, with our app, very important for us. Uh, two million people have downloaded it. Uh, the most key thing for me, and there's a picture of MotoGP on there, which is one of the rights we have, is about second screen experience. Everyone talks about second screen. What they really mean is, instead of talking to the missus, you're looking at what the football score is while the telly's on. Real second screen is about watching MotoGP and having a heli helicopter camera there and having a racetrack there and having cameras on riders going around that you can cut in and out of your TV experience. Uh, and that's absolutely critical for me. So anyway, I'm running out of time, but... What have I learnt across my career? Three kings, and, and I, I'm fascinated. I've been going to conferences for a long, 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 long time, and change management's always up there, and people talk about effective change management. Um, it's business as usual. If I actually look back at my whole career, it's not change management, it's business. Business evolved, people evolved. Uh, and I think it's really important that companies stop having change programmes. They stop having project management programs leading that, and they have project management that underpins their core business, which is change. Um, and that has to go right into the culture of things. It's very hard, isn't it, when you're in an environment where we need to do this, and, and change scares people. People get nervous about it. When I, I set up BT Sport, you know, I inducted personally around about 200 people from launch, and I was able to put a culture in place from the start, and that's very, very rare. Normally, you have two cultures clashing together. But at our heart was change, and we will change, and we'll continue to change. And if you're not prepared to change, then you shouldn't be working with us. So that's absolutely critical for me. The second one, and excuse the football analogy, but you've got to be able to defend as well as score goals. I think a lot of startups, which is what I class us as, is it's all about winning by how many goals. And actually, what's absolutely critical is getting your foundations right and making sure you can defend your position. So I spend as much time looking backwards as I do looking forwards. Um, and that's absolutely critical. Um, but you do need goals. You, you do need to score the odd one and show you're winning and show what you're doing is right. And then the most important one for me, this is absolutely the most important one. Um, you've got to have a culture that allows people to get things wrong. And that's not just some bullshitty comment at a conference. It's absolutely true. I would say some of the best decisions or some of the best successes I've had in my career is when I've got something spectacularly wrong. Because that's where you learn. And if you've got an environment where you allow people to get things wrong, that also means they're ambitious. That also means they're prepared to try different things. Um, really important for me. And, and this picture is quite important as well because this also reflects the fact if you put that in the mirror, you can see you're going the wrong way. So again, it reflects. Keep looking back. Keep looking back. When you get things wrong, learn from it. Um, so I'm actually, I think, spot on time. So I've rambled quite well. Uh, I think, you know, just to finish from me, is 
I think what BT Sport epitomises, but more important, what BT epitomises, is you've got to be brave, you've got to be bold, you've got to be absolutely proud of who you work for and what you do, which I definitely am, but most of all, you've got to be disruptive. Thank you. Thank you.